Hello, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be starting in one minute. Hello and welcome to the joint EAL and ECA webinar covering prosumers, electrical installations and important electrical updates. So to run through the meeting format today, please type any questions you may have into the question and answer area within the Zoom platform. The webinar today will be divided into two sections, so we will have two opportunities for questions and answers. All attendees will be muted and the session will be recorded for distribution later. So the agenda today, we have welcome and introductions, and then I will be, be discussing EAL's new electrical energy storage system qualification. We will then have an update from Luke Osborne from the ECA discussing prosumers electrical installations. And then we'll have our first question and answer session. We will then move on to the second part of the webinar, where I will be discussing the changes to the level three electrotechnical qualification and the experienced worker qualification and other forthcoming developments. And then finally, the second question and answer session. So to introduce the speakers today, you have myself, Kevin Sparrow, Industry and Portfolio Manager for BSE. And I'm delighted to introduce you to special guest speaker, Luke Osborne, Energy and Emerging Technology Solutions Advisor from the ECA. Luke provides advice and technical coverage for ECA members on renewable energy, electric vehicles, energy efficiency, energy trends and policy. So first, I'm going to provide a summary of EAL's new award in the design, installation and commissioning of electrical energy storage systems. It's a short award aimed at practicing electricians within the industry, and it will enable the learner to understand both technical and safety areas of these systems and the skills involved in their installation, commissioning and handover. It's a short award with 23 GLH and a total qualification time of 27 hours. It has one unit and is assessed by an on screen exam and a centre marked practical assessment. Within this award, learners will understand the safety hazards and safety implications of batteries, such as DC arc flashes, fire hazards, and it follows the contents of the IT's code of practice. Learners will understand the different types of batteries and their benefits and applications and understand the different coupling modes, architectures and operating states. Learners will also understand how to specify and design an EESS in line with MCS guidance using lookup tables and designing for island mode operation. They'll also learn how to design a system in line with BS7671, the battery standard and the IET code of practice. With increasing energy costs and consumers switching to sustainable technologies, this new battery qualification, together with our existing solar PV award, provides an excellent package to centres and learners. In addition to this, we have our existing electric vehicle charging equipment qualification, so it helps to build a comprehensive PEI offer to prospective learners. And finally, both the solar and this new energy storage qualification are fully MCS approved, so you can have confidence it meets industry requirements. This new qualification has two assessment components. Firstly, an on-screen exam consisting of 30 questions over 60 minutes. It is an open book exam and there are four publications the learner may reference. 
There is also an EAL set and centre marked practical assessment. We have specified an exemplar rig in the qualification materials. Centres are allowed to design their own rigs as long as it meets the EAL practical requirements. Uh, the rig needs to be capable of going into island mode. The practical assessment follows a typical real world scenario where the ladder is assessed on specifying the appropriate battery for island mode and for maximising self-consumption of electrical energy from a solar PV system. And then installation of specified components and commissioning of the rig. Um, the qualification is graded pass or fail only. All materials are available from EAL online services. So if you have any questions about it, please get in touch or contact your EQA. So thanks for listening to my first update. And I'm now going to pass on to Luke, who will talk through prosumers electrical installations. And bear with me, please. I'm just going to hand over control to Luke. Over to you, Luke. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. And uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, thanks for letting me have a little slot here. Um, yeah, so I look after energy and emerging tech for ECA. So they're the uh, Co Electrical Contractors Association. And uh, I just want to put uh, a bit of meat on the bones and contextualize, contextualize uh, some of the, the reasons why we're going in this direction. So as you can see, the, the title of this is Electrical Energy Storage Systems and the Energy Prosumer, Putting the Hero into Net Zero, um, because battery storage is critical for how are we going to get where we need to be by 2050? So how are we going to get our energy systems ready for net zero uh, by 2050? Well, we can either have an increasing amount of renewable energy generation uh, than is required. So uh, generating excess amounts uh, to allow for a reduction in the output. We can increase the energy storage capabilities in the system. Obviously, this is the bit you're interested in. And uh, also maximise the energy efficiencies and the flexibility that we have in our uh, energy systems around us. And in reality, it's a combination of all three of these, but with a particular focus on increasing the energy storage and also maximising the energy efficiencies and having that flexibility um, in the system. And this is... The direction of travel that the the DNOs um, are going in, uh, and this report from when it was Bayes, the transitioning to a net zero energy system, uh, kind of highlights the pathways uh, that we need to do this. And um, it's going to be one heck of a journey. Uh, we've got quite aging infrastructure around us, uh, and some of this involves um, grid tied battery storage, uh, but a lot of it will be behind the meter in uh, in people's homes and in their businesses but there's huge benefits to having battery storage systems um, energy prices aren't likely to return to pre-pandemic levels um, we've got a huge amount of self-generated energy being installed uh, we've had six years consistent growth uh, in this area um, there's hundreds of megawatts uh, in the pipeline for solar pv uh, and there's been an 80% drop in costs for PV since 2015. Uh, so all these things are, are encouraging people to have more installed. And obviously they need to maximize, maximize their, their generation. And all these lead to increased opportunities, not just for the contractors, but also for the, the, the training providers as well. We need to make sure we have a suitably skilled and capable workforce and uh, they will need to go through the upskilling. But one of the main reasons people tend to choose to have battery storage so in their homes is because the periods of occupancy doesn't equate to the periods of generation. So as you can see on the chart here, this is a typical load profile, okay, roughly drawn, uh, for, for when people are using the energy in their homes. And that's totally out of step with when their PV systems will be generating energy. Um, so at the moment, if they, if in the absence of a battery storage system, 
all this big section in the middle will be being exported at a low rate uh, back to the uh, energy supplier. Uh, the bid in green is the, the amount that they're uh, consuming, so making use of. But if you add a battery storage system, they can then move that middle section into, uh, into accessible stored energy uh, that they can use uh, when they come home or when they're back in the property. So instead of exporting at a rate probably around five, 10 pence per kilowatt hour, and then buying the energy back at a rate of th around 35 pence per kilowatt hour, they're saving a lot of money by doing this. But it's not just when they've got their own generation. You're, you're seeing uh, electrical energy storage systems or batteries uh, also being installed to make use of uh, time of use and variable tariffs. You can see on the screen here how some of the, the, the tariffs are now being, um, being made available. So the, the fixed blue line is your, your historic fixed rate tariffs. You can see the blocks, the upper peak, the mid peak and the peak. These are currently quite commonly available, uh, Octopus and some of the others. Uh, so you've got specific times uh, where you've got different prices during those periods. And it's to make sure that people aren't uh, putting undue stress on the electricity system on the peak times, typically between uh, 4 p.m. and 7 p.m. But the big squiggly line there as well is something called dynamic time of use tariffs. With smart meters, uh, you've got hour, uh, half hourly metering. So the networks can offer real time pricing depending on demand and try and encourage people to shift shift their loads away from this, particularly important as we go for the electrification of vehicles uh, and the electric, electrification of heat with heat pumps. Uh, so being able to encourage people to use energy outside of those times is really beneficial. And that's another aspect for having battery storage systems. And also last year we had uh, the, the new version of the British standards come out. Uh, and that included a whole new part and a whole new chapter. So we had part eight and chapter 82, the prosumers low voltage electrical installations. And with this, within this, this brought in uh, some new terms of the, the prosumer, the energy prosumer and the prosumers electrical installation. So what is this? Well, our buildings and our, our, yeah, our buildings have operated in a unidirectional flow uh, of energy for the past you know, 50, 100 years. So you've just got the energy coming into the building, it's just being consumed. But with everything changing, you're, you're having this prosumer model. So buildings are having their on site generation, so they're producing energy and they're also consuming energy and they're exporting energy. So you've got this bi directional flow, this flexibility that's really important to get us where we need to be being incorporated into all our buildings. And this is going to grow massively going forward. There was a report that came out by SSEN today, uh, which indicates that there's gonna be a 2000 times increase uh, in the amount of uh, battery storage systems that are deployed by 2030. So that is a huge amount um, that's being adopted by society. And the prosumer's electrical installation, it starts to incorporate a massive array of technologies. So you've got your, your smart electric vehicle charge points, you've got vehicle to grid, which is going to become more apparent in the next few years, being able to store uh, and use the energy within, that, uh, within those vehicles. Uh, you've got heat pumps, you've got direct electrification of heating, um, you've got the, uh, the, the generation, the storage, and all the smart controls and metering that go behind it as well. So our installations are, are going to become more complex, more intelligent, uh, but offer far better services to the end users. But in order to have this flexibility and, and for it to function correctly, there needs visibility on what's being used when, where the capacity is, um, what, what can be offloaded and sent back to the networks. And so this is, this is a bit of a crude diagram here, and it shows lots of additional meters for all different devices, uh, all, all the different circuits. Um, in reality, you're, you're starting to have these electrical energy management systems. Uh, so these communicate with the, with the PV inverter, with the battery storage system. Uh, 
the electric vehicle charge point, um, the heat pump systems as well. But you're starting to get individual devices. Uh, there's a platform, I think it's called Smart Connect. Uh, so you're having devices from the likes of Bosch and Siemens and the others, which can also operate on load control and be configured in this manner. All helps to encourage the, the self-consumption and uh, the, the load management to make sure that we've increased, um, increased requirements in vehicles and heating. You're not going to exceed uh, what's available at the income to these buildings. Now we come on to the battery storage side of things. And there was this quote, he was a, a guy you're probably aware of. So Thomas Edison, famous inventor. When a man gets onto accumulators, rechargeable batteries, his inherent capacity for lying comes in. And um, what he's referring to is it, it's really important to understand the marketing. Uh, for example, on your screen here, there's two different diagrams. On the left-hand side, you've got a depiction of a battery. So it's important to know what you're being told by the manufacturer. For example, this battery here, it's got a physical capacity of 10 kilowatt hours. It can hold 10 kilowatt hours, but it can't discharge uh, that whole amount of energy. So inherently, especially battery, uh, especially lithium ion batteries, they can only go down uh, to a depth of discharge of about 10, 20%, depends on the manufacturer. Um, so in this example, there's only nine kilowatt hours of available energy uh, available to use. Um, they are getting better. Most manufacturers do now state um, the usable capacity, but it's not always the case. So it's really important to understand what is available there and to understand what is being marketed there. Um, and on the right hand side, you can see the power delivery, the C rate. So even though someone has a 10 kilowatt hour battery, it doesn't always mean that they can draw 10 kilowatts of power from that. Um, and this is normally, the information is normally represented in, uh, in the capacity rate, the C rate. So in this example here, if you had a 10 kilowatt hour battery, so we'll look at the orange line here. Uh, at a C rate of one, this is able to deliver 10 kilowatts of power for one hour. But if it's designated at a C rate of two, so as its maximum continuous power that can be delivered. So if it, if it advertises that it's a 10 kilowatt hour battery uh, that operates at a C rate of two C, that means it will only be able to deliver five kilowatts of power for two hours. Conversely, if you had, um, I don't imagine there's any out there, but uh, it's quite possible, the battery capable of delivering at a 0.5 C rate, that would be able to deliver 20 kilowatts of power, but for 30 minutes. So different manufacturers market things different ways. So it could be represented as the C rate, or as maximum continuous power demand, but they're important things to understand. So the nitty-gritty of this all, so how do you connect a, a battery storage system? Well, all these things are gonna be covered in the, in the qualification and, and, the, and the training that you'll be providing, but uh, it's important to have a, a bit of an overview. So you've got the AC coupled side of things. So if you're adding in uh, a a battery storage system to an existing PV system. Without having to change the inverter, you can add on a new system with an additional inverter. So you've got the existing setup, uh, which is uh, obviously converting the, the, the DC from the solar panel to AC to feed into the consumer unit. And then you've got a similar but reversed arrangement for the additional battery. It does mean having two inverters. So you wouldn't tend to specify this for a new system. Uh, but good for retrofitting to existing systems. But most of the things uh, that uh, installers will be doing uh, as a complete system will be through a DC couple or a hybrid system. So you've just got one single inverter. Um, so it's all contained within that inverter. The DC is operating on, uh, the battery is operating on DC. Uh, the solar panels provide DC. You've just got one conversion uh, before it goes to the consumer unit. 
So it saves the uh, conversion losses that you would have uh, from an AC coupled system. But importantly, going forward, people are looking for maintained loads as well. Uh, so people are conscious that, okay, we could have grid outages. Uh, so some inverters, some systems are able to offer the capability for having specific AC maintained loads. So these could be for, for lighting, emergency lighting or fridge freezers or certain sockets, uh, things that aren't likely to draw huge amount of loads. So you wouldn't want to put an induction hob on these, for example, um, but it just ensures that there's still power available uh, when systems do, uh, if there is a power outage. But there are specific earthing conditions that, that apply in these scenarios. So with this instance, so with people asking like, can they run a building off grid uh, by using these technologies? Well, they can. Um, and this is the island mode, and this is what needs to be uh, specified. And it's the, um, it's the ability for the battery storage system to continue to provide that power during a blackout. It's not available by all battery storage systems, uh, and these can operate either automatic or by manual switchover. But there's particular things that need to be considered on this. Um, you've got to have an island mode isolator. So to ensure that um, if there is an outage, the battery or the inverter that's connected to it cannot export uh, the power back to the grid because obviously people could be working on the fault, uh, assuming that, uh, uh, and rightly assuming that no power is going to be exported. And also there needs to be this neutral earth bond relay. Uh, and these, these items generally uh, are contained within these inverters. Uh, so it's critically important to make sure that you understand what is being offered by these manufacturers. Um, and on the left hand side of the screen, you can see how the island mode isolator and the neutral uh, bond relay operate. So when they're connected, when the system is connected and the grid is live, uh, you've got the, uh, the line conductors connected, but the neutral uh, relay is open. There's a power loss. The line conductor um, relay opens. The neutral earth relay closes to make sure that you've, you've got that safety uh, in place there. And the reverse happens, uh, obviously, when, um, when the grid power is restored. You need to have the additional earthing there. Uh, you can't rely on the DNO's earthing connection in these instances. So you would have to have additional earth, uh, earthing uh, put onto the system as well. So really important considerations that do need to be put across. And then I think we come on to the final slide. Uh, that, that neutral earth bond relay there can also be called a referencing relay. Um, so in summary, what is an electrical energy storage system? Uh, what is a battery? It's a huge opportunity for, for you, for your training centres, and for all the electricians out there that need upskilling to be able to deliver this information. And that's it from me. So I think we have a Q&A session now. So uh, if there's any questions here, uh, do feel free to ask um, Kevin. Thank you, Luke. That was fascinating. Um, so I'll just have a review of the questions in the chat. Um, OK, we have um, first one is I think I can answer this. So the question is, how can I get up to speed with energy storage with a view uh, to delivering this qualification? Yeah, that's a really good uh, question, because I think it's, in many instances, it's a bit like chicken and egg. I think essentially um, that we do have, there are a few early adopters of the EAL qualification. It's only uh, just launched um, in April. So if you do contact EAL, um, we'll be able to direct you to centres who are setting up to deliver um, this qualification. Um, I'd also suggest, you know, attend industry events, you know, if, you, if you're potentially any further ECA events, regional events, um, the IET as well, they have their academy, um, they've got a, an excellent uh, course on there, and of course the IET code of practice, uh, you know, absolutely absorb yourself in that, um, manufacturers training as well, very good, um, and of course, um, you know, you're not all really already have done this. Um, so undertake the solar PV qual qualification. 
And importantly, you know, if you can get that opportunity, get out onto site with the contractor to get hands on with that technology, because I think that's really important to be able to, you know, real, you know, uh, relay those real life uh, experiences um, that contractors are going to potentially come across. So hopefully that answers that question. Um, so moving on. Um, oh, OK, so. I think this question is asking, do any other AOs, I think in this space, um, we are the, the with the solar and the battery, uh, we, we are the, the main awarding organization offering this uh, currently. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, definitely look to EAL. I don't think there's, there's many other AOs out there offering this. So <laughs> I'll be honest with that answer. So, uh, you know, we do have that comprehensive PEI package, as, as I've already previously described. Um, and there's a further question here. Um, for the new qualification, do you have to do a full install? Will there be clarity on this in the spec documents? Yeah, I can answer this. So within the installation, there is selecting cables. So no, the, the, the rig itself is fixed. Uh, because the battery is um, quite a heavy piece of equipment. So there's a there's a number of fixed um, items already. And um, we've even thought about in how we've made the practical so the components on the board don't get um, worn out too easily, the terminals, et cetera, et cetera. So within the rig itself, uh, we've actually specified all the components that the learner has to uh, select and install. So I think it's... Um, some AC cabling and some DC cabling and some uh, bonding. And from memory, I think there is a data cable as well uh, that needs to be extended that goes to a current transformer. Um, so it's, it's kind of in tune with many of the real world um, things that a learner would have to do, an uh, electrician would have to do. Um, and with this actual practical, you know, we worked very closely with um, battery manufacturers and also a battery contractor. Um, so it was trying to work out, you know, the sorts of problems the um, electricians can come across. And also the installation, finally, it does enable the qualification to meet mandated industry technical competencies, um, which enables the qualification to be fully industry uh, supported. So final question. Uh, oh, there's a few more coming in now. Um, do you see this as a two, three, four day course with assessment, I think potentially, yes, it, it could be a, a, a short, because it is a short award, um, you know, I instinctively look to deliver it, you know, over a full day, or it could be uh, completed in the evenings. Um, I think also some of the uh, qualification aspects, potentially if you're enrolling learners, uh, you could even give them some pre-reading uh, before they come onto the qualification. So. Um, they're starting the qualification with, you know, some um, prior level of knowledge and understanding, almost in tune with the um, the concepts Luke's presented today with the different um, coupling methods, etc. So moving on from there, another question, is funding available and what would be the qualification requirements be for the candidates? So currently uh, this qualification uh, isn't funded. But it's not to say that uh, funding may, you know, it may become available in future. Um, certainly as, you know, we, there's a, a drive to net zero by 2050. So I think, you know, it's, it's likely in future the, the government may make funding available for these sorts of qualifications. Um, so if, if, even when we can achieve funding, we'll certainly let uh, centres know on that point. And Actually, the other... Ke Kevin, can yes. I just jump in quickly? Yes, please, Luke. Um, the, the JIB do offer, a, oh, they do have a training fund for JIB registered electricians, uh, which isn't commonly known about. They, they, they do try and put this information out there, uh, but it's not commonly taken up. But uh, yeah, if, if you have any uh, applicants that are registered with the JIB, do encourage them to approach JIB because they will provide funding for these uh, these new courses. That's absolutely a brilliant piece of advice. What we'll do then, when we send out the uh, the the link to the recording, I'll uh, we'll send out a link to the JIB as well. So I think that would be really useful for centres. Thank you, Luke. 
and um, what would be the qualification requirements for candidates. Um, this qualification is for um, experienced uh, competent electricians only. Um, so all the entry requirements are in the qualification manual. And essentially this is because, you know, the, the safety and, and technically critical nature of, of batteries. And I don't think we have any further questions. Um, if you do think of anything in the meantime on what has been presented so far, please pop it in the chat. Um, oh, there we do have another question. Um, are the assessment document, documents being uploaded on EAR Hub? Yeah, uh, all the materials are available via online services. Um, if you do need um, assistance in obtaining those, uh, please contact uh, EAR Customer Experience. Actually, Kevin, can I just jump in, jump in quickly? Yes. Uh, with, with the thing about the pre-qualification people doing this, uh, yeah, they, they, this is going to be something for uh, nearly all of these upskilling courses going forward. They, the, uh, uh, people that have taken these courses will need to be uh, industry trained and skilled electricians and uh, essentially following this electrician plus model uh, that industry is rolling out. Uh, as, uh, as Kevin mentioned, there's, there's considerable safety issues here. Um, and yeah, it just helps to ensure that we've got the uh, skilled and competent workforce required. 100% Luke, yeah, completely agree. Thank you for that. And um, so, okay, another question. Can the same clarity be included in the solar course spec? Is, is kind of, yeah, absolutely. If, if the learner entry requirements are open to interpretation, absolutely, we, we can work to pin those down further. Um, no problem at all. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to move on to the next part of the presentation now. Um, so within this part of the presentation, I will be discussing um, electrical updates um, to existing qualifications. So, so right, here we are. So, um, so I'm going to start with changes to the level three electrotechnical qualification or 7345. Uh, this qualification forms part of the apprenticeships in England and Northern Ireland. However, some of the changes are only applicable to England. Um, now, because of version two of the apprenticeship standard in England, uh, which is expected to come into force from this September, uh, we are currently revising the qualification content and some of the assessment requirements for the on-site performance units. Um, so for new apprentices in England only, there is a requirement for one of the evidence jobs to come from a commercial industrial setting um, for those performance uh, units listed. So we have unit one, apply health and safety, unit four, design and installation, unit five, termination and connection, and also the maintenance performance unit. And in England, if a learner is solely working in the domestic sector, they should be undertaking uh, the domestic electrician standard. Other changes applicable to both England and Northern Ireland are the theory units have been updated to include an awareness of periodic inspection and testing. And there are some other minor, minor technical updates around new technologies and fire safety. Some of the unit titles are likely to be updated and guided learning hours is likely to expand. Um, but we are not introducing further knowledge assessments and all changes to the theory units will be incorporated into the existing assessments and start to appear from 2024 to give you and learners time to get up to speed with the changes. So now as mentioned, for new apprentices from September in England only, uh, they'll be required to evidence work from a non-domestic location. Um, so I've defined this on this slide. So in summary, domestic premises are family dwellings, HMOs, sheltered and supported housing. Um, they do not include lar larger communal areas or the range of locations listed in the exemptions. So please refer to this to ensure students are registered onto the appropriate apprenticeship. And all of this detail will be available in the updated materials uh, shortly. So moving on to updates, um, to, on changes to the performance units from September 23. Um, so this is applicable to England and Northern Ireland. So in unit four, um, apply design, installation, practices and procedures. 
Um, this, this update I'm showing here will also transfer to the connection and termination unit. So the change there is highlighted in blue. There'll now be five types of cables will now be required to be evidenced for the installation, termination and connection. This is an increase of one more cable. And as highlighted in green, power over ethernet and DC cabling have also been included. Um, apprentices will also need to evidence five types of equipment. Again, this is an increase of one additional item with further items highlighted in green that may be evidenced. And finally, the range requirements for containment have been uh, reshuffled and at least three items must be evidenced from the groupings as shown. So that's one type of PVC containment, one metallic and one from the remainder of the list. So I'm going to move on now to important updates and changes to the level three electrotechnical experienced worker qualification. So this forms part of the industry experienced worker assessment. So the plan is from September, um, and this, this is just to give you that upfront notification, it will require a minimum level two technical certificate type qualification for entry. So these would typically be the uh, EAL level two diploma in electrical installation. It could be Sigling Girls 2365 or intermediate diploma in electrical installation or equivalents. So those short level two uh, domestic type qualifications will not be accepted. So we're talking about the older DEI type qualifications. Um, the evidence requirements will be updated in line with changes to the level three electrotechnical qualification or the 7345 which I've just been through. Um, it is also uh, very likely there'll be a requirement for, for a professional discussion in the workplace as part of the direct observation. Now, also in addition to this, we will be launching this summer a new qualification for experienced workers in the domestic sector with the draft title of Level 3 Electrotechnical in Dwellings Experienced Worker Qualification. Um, so this will enable the candidate to obtain a gold card in the domestic sector and be industry recognised in their role. Um, it is only for those um, electricians with three or more years experience working uh, in the industry, not including time spent in educational training. So it will involve a comprehensive skill scan, the combined initial and periodic inspection and testing CBD unit, wiring regulations unit, direct observation in the workplace with a professional discussion. And as expected, finally, outside of the qualification, there'll be an uh, industry end test, so an AM2D uh, from NET. So um, we will be publishing full details about this in the summer. So look out for further notifications and communications. So finally, I just wanted to mention qualifications which may be of interest. We have a fairly new CPD award for electricians, which is the level three award in the requirements for fire detection and alarm systems in dwellings. And in development for 2025 in England, we are currently developing a new funding qualification for adults. This is 19 plus age range who wish to retrain in the, se in the sector. So IFATE in England have opened up a new qualification category um, that can be taken outside of a T-level. So we're working with employers developing this qualification very rapidly at the moment. So if you are an employer or you know employers who wish to be involved with the development, please do get in touch. Um, these qualifications will be funded. So within BSE, we have, uh, we're developing one for electrical installation and also one for plumbing and heating. So please let your colleagues know in, in the plumbing and heating department if you're at a college. Um, we will also be developing a new funded level two provision for the 16 to 19 age range in England with more details to follow. So these qualifications will give options uh, outside the T level in England. So I'm sure you'd be very excited to hear about that. So thank you for listening today. We'd be delighted to take any further questions you may have on what has been covered today. So I'll just check uh, through the questions, uh, see what we have. Um, okay, so, um, okay, so we've got another question. This is going back to the batteries. Um, 
what qualifications would a teacher trainer need to have to be able to deliver uh, the battery qualification? Um, I'd, I'd have to check the qualification manual. Um, please do have a look on EAL online services. Um, I think generally they uh, just need to have the knowledge and understanding of the, the content of the qualification. Um, I, I don't think there is a specific qualification needed. Um, so I think, as I mentioned before, there's there's a range of ways that you can get up to speed uh, and learn about the the new technology. Um, ne next question: How will we know um, when the materials are updated for the level three electrotechnical qualification and the existing experienced worker qualification? Um, yeah, really important updates. Those are. We will send out notification as soon as we have those materials ready. We were aiming to get those out um, around about now, um, but IFATE has have, have asked us to, to do some further updates. So those updates will occur in a couple of weeks. Um, and, and those updates are really aligning the qualification to mandated technical competencies within the industry. Um, so, yeah, we, we, we're going to do those very rapidly and get those updates out to you. Um, so next question. Um, what if we are not sure if the apprentice should undertake the level three electrotechnical qualification or the level three electrotechnical in dwellings qualification apprenticeship? I think um, I think with that, I think. It's, it's about that learner interview, that apprentice interview. So speak to the uh, the employer, see what types of work they're undertaking, and um, we'll we'll provide in the qualification materials a description of what's domestic, what's non-domestic. So potentially they're working in blocks of flats, for example, or um, you know a H where there's a large communal area. That that may indeed mean they can undertake the full scope uh, electrotechnical qualification. Or if they're solely working in dwelling type family units, then therefore, you know, they should really be undertaking um, the domestic uh, electrician standard. So I have another question here. Uh, the new experienced electrical worker qualification, um, will you need a level two electrical diploma for entry? Yes, that, that is right, yeah. Um, I think this is about raising the, the threshold to get onto that uh, qualification to really give the industry that confidence that the people who are accessing that qualification um, are really genuine experienced workers. And I think um, we, we will give a, a suitable notification. So if, if there are any learners who, who are wishing to um, come onto the qualification now, they'll have that space now to, to undertake it on the uh, current requirements and therefore after likely September the date is still to be agreed but it's important to give you that notification um, they will need that level two uh, qualification. So I'm just moving on to the next question now what if the apprentice, apprentice employer does not meet the range of the 7345 do they go on the domestic yeah, absolutely, absolutely. They they should do. Um, so I think this is very much like the previous question. Um, it's about discussing with the uh, employer to see this, the range and scope of the work uh, the learner is undertaking. Um, and so sometimes um, if, if for larger contractors, they maybe have uh, um, apprentices working solely in domestic, so they may have to switch them around different jobs to get them on different experiences. But ultimately, again, if they're working in the domestic space, they should be doing the uh, domestic electrician standard. So next question here, uh, the 1605 qualification. So why has the, the uh, 1605 qualification or the MVQ diploma not been aligned with the 7345? Um, yeah, I think it's because that qualification now, it doesn't form part of any uh, apprenticeship at the moment. And I think, it, although it has been updated for AM, um, Amendment 2, um, it, it, you know, it's likely these, uh, these qualifications, we will uh, update them ongoing. So it may, it may indeed be updated like that. So we will work with industry to make sure the 1605 uh, meets industry requirements. But at the moment, it, it could be uh, completed in, in a domestic setting. And uh, the domestic course code, um, okay, so we can send the domestic uh, 
uh, qualification, Let's technical qualification code out in the um, with this uh, presentation today. And next question. Um, will EAL provide scale scan samples for the installation and domestic routes for us to use with learners employers as other awarding bodies do? OK, I think if you go into online services, those scale scan documents should be available. Um, I will double check it just in case they haven't. Uh, they, they're not. But as far as I understand, they are available. But uh, as I say, I will check that. Next question, um, what happens to experienced workers who have no qualifications at all? Yeah, I think at the moment, I think that their route would be to undertake a, um, a level two, uh, you know, technical certificate type qualification. I think that would be their, their route. Um, but, you know, there is also that option if, if there are learners, you, you've got learners in the pipeline um, coming on board, they, they still have that you know, that period of time before the requirements change to undertake the qualification as, as it currently stands. So moving on to possibly the final question, um, is there no change to the knowledge units within the 7345? Yes, so just to confirm, there will be some slight changes to the knowledge units in the 7345, but to be honest, they, they are relatively minor. Um, the changes are around introduction of some content around fire safety. Um, we have some content around lighting and um, the awareness of periodic inspection and testing within the inspection and testing unit. Um, so there'll, there'll be, uh, there's not actually going to be any further assessments introduced and these updates will be uh, covered in the existing online exams and assignments. So those updates will uh, be applicable to all learners, whether they'll be whether they're on in England on version one of the apprenticeship standard or on version two. So therefore, we will start to roll out the, the changes in the theory units from 2024 um, to really give you that opportunity for those learners to get up to speed with those changes and centers as well. Next question then, is there any intent to put three phase practical assessments in the 7345? Um, there's not any intention at the moment, but as we review the qualification, that's a really good point because the qualification would be, you know, more applicable to, you know, domestic, commercial and industrial electricians. So I think that's a good point. As we review the qualification, um, it, it, it could be likely we do introduce, um, you know, some free phase work. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll take that on board and we, we will look at that next time we review those assessments. So that's a really good point. Um, there's lots of questions here. Um, I'll try and get through as many as I can. If, if we don't get through all today, uh, we will respond um, separately and we'll come back to you. So I'll take a couple more. Um, so for units one to four, can the installation and domestic apprenticeship be run alongside one another in the classroom? Then cohorts separated for the final units, five plus for the final two years, depending on installation or domestic route. Or are they to be run completely separate? Yeah, that's a really good point. And this is something, you know, we discuss with the industry uh, body, you know, TESP is the main industry body we deal with. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's how whether you've got learners undertaking a domestic electrical installation apprenticeship or, or they're doing the uh, existing uh, level three electrotechnical qualification. So it's, it's blending those learners into the same classroom. So absolutely, there is definitely crossover between what those um, learners are doing. And in many instances, it, it's identical, but it's just more around the context of the installation within that delivery, within the installation that they'll actually be you know, learning about. So I think with that, um, when have a look at the both the content and the units, and you'll see that the units do have, follow a similar pattern. They have similar titles. Um, so in many instances, yes, you would be absolutely be able to deliver those units um, to the same um, learners, depend, you know, they're doing domestic, uh, or, or full scope electrical work. 
So I'll take this as the last question before we draw to a close today. Um, is the length of stay expected to be extended in September as ESS test communicated? Um, I, I think maybe, I, I, if I'm understanding that question correctly, it may be to do with um, the implementation of version two of the apprenticeship standard. Um, as far as I understand at the moment, is it, we're working to the September that IFAB will switch to version two of the uh, uh, apprenticeship standard. Um, so please, you know, have a look on the IFAB website as this gets updated. And we will absolutely keep you informed of changes. Uh, we want to make sure these changes are manageable for you. Um, so as these developments are uh, moving forward, we will be in touch with you over the coming weeks and coming months to make sure um, as soon as we get this information, we, we can then pass it on to you. So I'm gonna draw the uh, webinar to a close now. And just to say, thanks for joining. Um, it's been excellent to uh, deliver this today. And uh, Luke, uh, absolute thanks to you. Your, your presentation was brilliant, much appreciated. It was a pleasure. Uh, Thank Thanks you. For having me. Oh, back. excellent. And um, I'm sure um, we'd, we'd like to invite you back again, Luca, uh, at another, another time. Yeah, of course. Thank you. And just to say, if you have any uh, questions, uh, further questions, please um, get in touch. We have, we have the EAL customer experience email address there and also our product query email address also. So drawing to a close, ladies and gentlemen, again, thank you very much, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you.